hier in dit prachtige zaal. Welkom bij Meer Business Amsterdam en Adriba. Fijn dat jullie er zijn. Ik wil even de gelegenheid nemen om Meer Business aan u voor te stellen. Meer Business is een zakenplatform voor ondernemers en directeuren. Nou, wat doet zo'n platform nou? Ik noem onszelf maar even een makelaar van face-to-face -face contacten. Dus ik hoop dat u straks even achter u kijkt, voor u kijkt, wie zit er nou tegenover u, bij de borrel straks. U heeft misschien al wat mensen contacten opgedaan bij de koffie en bij de thee. Uh, ik wil u in ieder geval van harte uitnodigen bij een heel groot evenement wat wij organiseren. En dat is op 2 december aanstaande Amsterdam Business Inspiration en de uitreiking van de Uni Next Unicorn Awards. Uh, we verwachten ongeveer 800 à 1000 ondernemers en directeuren in de beurs van Berlage. Dat soort grote sessies doen we ook, maar we doen ook evenementen als deze. Nou, ik zal het niet langer maken, want u zit natuurlijk uh, te wachten op uh, een heel andere persoon die daar zit. Maar die gaat iemand anders aan u introduceren. Erik. Dankjewel, Ursula. Uh, goedemiddag allemaal. Velen van u kennen en een aantal van u kennen niet. Laat ik beginnen voordat Ober Dennels uh, aan het woord gaat aan u een vraag stellen. Wie maakt het wel eens mee binnen organisaties dat je mensen eigenlijk iets wil vertellen, iets vragen om te doen en dat ze het niet doen? Dat ze het niet doen. Wie maakt het wel eens mee? Wij gaan allemaal aan voorstellen. Ja. Want wie doet als ze het zeggen, als ze het niet doen, dan gaat het iets harder duwen. En ze doen het nog steeds niet. Maakt het wel eens mee? Ik maak het wel eens mee. Ik heb het heel lange tijd gedaan. Ik heb al lange tijd een bedrijf gehad in de detachering en de werking selectie. En daar was ik heel erg uh, vanuit de leidinggevende rol van, als je het doet, iets harder duwen en nog harder duwen en nog harder duwen. En soms werkt dat, maar vaak werkt dat niet. Ik ben in die zoektocht gegaan van hoe ga ik er nou voor zorgen dragen dat mensen nou op een, uh, op een leukere manier beïnvloed kunnen worden, op een slimmere manier beïnvloed kunnen worden. Waardoor zij het leuk vinden en ik ook het leuk vind. En waardoor ze de dingen gaan doen die eigenlijk het beste zijn voor de organisatie. In die zoektocht kwam ik aan de vuur terecht. Dan moet ik Marius niet kijken, ik zal zo heel kort even het woord aan hem geven. En Marius heeft mij eigenlijk daar geleerd van hoe je dat op een hele leuke manier kan doen, en op een goede manier kan doen, hoe je op de beste manier mensen kan beïnvloeden. En dat heeft alles te maken met gedrag en gedragsanalyse. Nou, dat vond ik zo interessant, ik ben bijna in de leer gegaan, maar hij heeft me daar echt, ik zou zeggen, alles in laten zien, velen laten zien, want alles is misschien een heel groot woord. En Marius heeft daarop geprobeerd, maar die heeft eigenlijk. Dat viel dus ook te pakken gekregen van de heer Opi Daniels, die zullen we zo meteen aan het woord zien. En Opi Daniels is eigenlijk de uh, founding father of organization Education management en heeft ook eigenlijk de term performance management geïntroduceerd. Nou, ik ga hem graag zo meteen het woord geven. Um, en ik hoop dat hij u vanmiddag inzichten kan geven in hoe je nou op een andere manier, op een leuke manier, slimmere manier, efficiëntere manier, uh, gedrag kan beïnvloeden op de werkomgeving. Uh, ik nodig u uit om vooral veel vragen te stellen. We hebben deze microfoon ter hand om ook de vragen goed verstaanbaar te kunnen maken. Dus laat het niet alleen een lezing zijn, maar laat het ook een interactie zijn dat u uw vragen stelt en antwoorden krijgt. Marius, mag ik jou heel kort het woord geven en zelf te introduceren? Dank voor de complimenten. Alsjeblieft, goed gedaan. Uh, welkom allemaal namens uh, mij, namens uh, Adriba. Ik ben wetenschappelijk directeur. Uh, Joost is uh, zakelijk directeur van uh, Adriba. We zijn nu vier jaar bezig. Adriba staat voor Opry Daniels Research Institute for Behavior Analysis. En uh, Erik uh, Overdik, maar ook Erik Vergeert hier, is, is een van de trainer coaches uh, die we hebben opgeleid. En we zien dat die mensen ook uh, meteen uh, ja, van het door het virus zijn uh, overweldigd uh, bijna. Ik zeg zelf dat ik wel eens. Uh, dat ik uh, internationaal drugsdealer uh, ben. Uh, ik gebruik geen uh, spuit om uh, mensen uh, verslaafd te maken, maar door complimenten te geven krijg je ook dopamine in je hersens. Ja. Niet alleen door ze in ontvangen, door complimenten te krijgen, maar ook door ze te geven krijg je dopamine. Nou, we zullen vandaag zien dat uh, complimenten geven maar een heel klein deel is van, uh, van performance management, van de OBM. Uh, vaak zijn complimenten helemaal niet uh, motiverend. Zullen we dat ook misschien nog uh, horen? Um, ja, ik heb gisteren op die al uh, twee sessies uh, zien uh, geven voor mijn academische collega's en uh, voor de OBM practitioners, die, uh, dat is de eerste opleiding die je uh, bij ons kan volgen. 
En uh, ja, het, het overtrof mijn verwachtingen. Ik dacht, de man is 80 jaar oud. Wat zal er nog uh, uitkomen? <lacht> hij hoort het toch niet. Dus. <lacht> ja, maar het blijkt ook dus dat hij een, uh, een moeder nog heeft die leeft. Die is 102, uh, wordt 102. Your mother will uh, be 102 years old next month. Eh? And she's still uh, alive and kicking. So, uh, um, so yeah, I, would, I was very much under the impression. I expect uh, that you that too should be. Aubrey, I would like to uh, give you the floor after Eric uh, has made some. How should we make it? De huishoudelijke mededeling, ik zou ze kort houden. Uh, de toilet heeft u wel niet gevoeld, mocht u naar de toilet moeten gaan, kan dat. De sessie duurt tot half zes. Om half zes willen wij graag, voor diegenen die dat kunnen en die dit ook graag willen, gaan wij naar het uh, bargedeelte toe. Daar krijgt u één consumptiebond in ieder geval door meer business aangeboden. En we kunnen nog even met elkaar onder het hapje en een drankje uh, napraten over wat we vanmiddag hebben, uh, voor inzet hebben gekregen. Dus daar nodig ik u graag uh, toe uit, dus half zes stoppen we en daarna kunt u uh, met, met ons uh, die kant op. Uh, Waarom applaus voor Opie Daniels? Thank you, I think. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> I'm lucky to be able to speak English, and some people say I don't speak it, speak it well, so... Um, nevertheless, I don't understand uh, Dutch very well. There are too many O's. <laughs> Not enough vowels. <laughs> you know, have all these consonants stacked up against each other. How do you speak it? I don't know. But uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to get this thing on my uh, belt. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Does he do that often? <laughs> good time because you laugh easily and I, a, a positive reinforcement needs to make people laugh. So if you want to reinforce something I say, you just smile or laugh and I'll be happy. Um, I, I, uh, I tell people that I'm probably one of the best examples of positive reinforcement that you can find because I've been positive reinforced for talking for 50 years and I can talk well beyond your ability to listen. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, if uh, you finish listening before I finish talking, just uh, get up and leave. All right. uh, how many of you have a problem? Could I see your hand? Have some kind of problem in your life? <laughs> how many of you who have a problem would have fewer problems if somebody else did what they were supposed to do? Now, if you get people to act right, you'd have fewer problems. And certainly we find that work, that's the case, right? We pay people, uh, we give them benefits, and they still don't act right. <coughs> I mean, we find that things are not done on time, or things are done with errors, or, or uh, they're too busy talking to each other to do their work. And so there are all kinds of issues that we have. Now, if you listen carefully, I'm going to tell you how to solve those problems. And I promise I'll do that. That's a catch, however. People don't do what they're told. You ever notice that? And of course, when people don't do what they're told, what do we do? What's the next response? If I tell you to put that book down and come to dinner, and you don't do it, what do I do? Tell them again, right? Now, the more times you tell them, the meaner you get. You ever notice that? <laughs> First time you say, hey, it's dinner time. I don't want to have to tell you again, it's dinner time. This is the last time I'm telling you. Get yourself in here. I mean, <laughs> uh, in, in the book, uh, Bring Out the Best of People, the third chapter is called Louder, Longer, and Meaner. And that's the progression that most people go. You know, you try to be nice, but when nice doesn't work, you ultimately get mean. You know, I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you again, or if I have to come in there, you'll be sorry. You know, something along those lines, right? 
Now, the thing that if taking business in America, sometimes to understand is that as much as they tell people what to do and they try to improve communication, they try to let people know precisely what it is they want to do, they don't do it. And we've been so trying to solve this problem for a thousand years. Oh, we're talking uh, about uh, my mother being 102, but you should see her mother. <laughs> Is she still alive? <laughs> Is she still alive? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> um, now, I, what I want to talk about for the next hour or so, and I'm going to try to stop, and Eric is going to... What I discovered yesterday is that half the population is named Eric. <laughs> we, had, we had six people on the meeting before everybody named Eric. And the way you talk the difference is some of them had a C and some of them had a K. Eric with a K, Eric with a C. But anyway, uh, somebody needs to tell me when I have five minutes left in the hour, right? Um, because I want to talk to you about the science of human behavior. Now, I, uh, like Morris, I grew up as a clinical psychologist and worked in a state hospital with, and had a private practice of people who had uh, problems. And um, the uh, gist of that was that I was trained clinically, traditionally, and I discovered, uh, even when I was being trained, that what I was doing wasn't working. You know, you think of a typical psychologist as, you know, rubbing his beard and saying, mmm, how does that make you feel? Mmm, mmm, mmm. You know, I realized that, that a, a therapist in most situations is a paid listener. You learn to listen to people because you didn't want to say too much because you want them to discover their problem. That was the theory anyway. It never worked. It didn't work. And when I was uh, in my internship, I was assigned uh, children as patients initially. And I'm trying to do that with a child? Come on. There's got to be a better way. And I would try to interpret the child's behavior, you know, the child would have a dog and pull the head off of a female doll and I would say, you hate your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know that? <laughs> but but uh, the, the point is that psychology, although if you had a test and they asked you to define psychology, if you said the size of human behavior, you'd get it right. You'd get it. But it is not. Psychology, there are more theories of behavior than there are psychologists. Because every psychologist has at least two. Now, if you think of the science of behavior, how can there be many sciences of behavior? It's a, a science, right? And a science should, should be comprehensive in terms of it explains behavior. Now, I was telling somebody earlier, I, uh, I started in a state hospital, and the reason I started in a state hospital was because we had uh, wards, we'd call them, that uh, they were so overcrowded that the back ward, you know, they said these people are basically hopeless, and so uh, they were lucky to even get medication because they were short-staffed. So when we came along and said, look, let's try something new. Come on in, come on in, oh God, come on in. Because they were, they were able to tell the politicians, we're, we're, we're doing these studies with these people. Well, the problem was, it exceeded beyond everybody's expectations, including their own. And people who had not uh, fed themselves, uh, go to the bathroom by themselves uh, for 20 years. All of a sudden, we're coming to dinner when called, we're uh, 
you know, going to the bathroom by himself, repeating himself, and so on. And as I say, in, in biblical days, this would have been called a miracle. You know, what's happened to him? All of a sudden, he's talking. Yet I had nobody heard him talk for 20 years. And I was talking. How did that happen? Well, it was because of a, a particular approach we were taking with them, which involved, um, as most people would come to understand, positive reinforcement. Now, I can tell you that uh, positive reinforcement is the most effective technique you can use to change the behavior of anybody anywhere. But by the same token, it is the most misunderstood and misused. I've been doing it in business for 40 years. I know I don't put that at all. I mean, you don't need to tell me. I, I, I know I don't put that at all. <laughs> I'm 80. I'm 80 years old. I'm even older than Mars. But you look younger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, you, you practice positive reinforcement very well. <laughs> uh, how many of you think, you, any, do, do you play golf in Holland? Has anybody played golf in Holland? No? I thought so. Oh, okay. Well, it, 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 do you think you could learn to play golf by reading a book? No. There's no way, because if, you, if you've got that book, I won't read it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's interesting how many people think they can attend a lecture like this and learn something. Most of you will not be able to tell your spouse tonight, your spouse at home, what you've heard today. Because I noticed most of you are not taking notes. So he couldn't even refer to you. Know, well, what did he talk about? Well, let me see. Here, he said, those of you who take notes will not learn the most. There's a saying, I love old sayings, and sometimes when I can't find an old saying, it's my purpose, I make it up. Because people love old sayings. You know, you know it has more weight than something. I, just, I say, oh, I just thought of something. That doesn't impress you. So now, here's an old saying. Oh, man, what was it? Now, listen to this carefully. Talking is learning. Listening is teaching. Now, that's true. Talking is learning. Listening is teaching. You, you thought it's all the way around, right? You thought I was going to teach you something. In reality, what I'm telling you is I'm teaching you. I'm, you're teaching me something. You've already done it because you laughed at my joke. My attempts to, at humor, you know, you laughed, you responded. Does that affect my behavior? Of course it does. I know it does. You fell into the trap of reinforcing me, see? And, and it's like, if I run over, it's not my fault. Because you reinforced me for talking, and talking beyond the limit of what I'm supposed to do. The reason I'm running the most is because I'm behaving the most, right? I'm moving about, I'm talking, I'm doing other things, and you're just sitting there, listen, your, your, your behavior is minimal. So you can't, very, you can't learn very much. Now, if you understand the full implication of that, then it has a lot of things to say about how you run a business, how you, uh, how you operate in terms of getting people to do the things that they're paid for and so on. Because most of the time, we try to tell them what to do, right? Well, they're not learning something. There's, a, there's another old saying, I didn't make this up, but it says, tell me now, teach me later. Because you learn when you receive consequences to your behavior. And so you're giving me consequences. You smile, you frown, or you look bored, or you do these things, and all those things impact what I do. Now, here's the important thing. I know that. But does it still affect my behavior? Of course it does. Because I'm a person, just like you're a person, and just because I know the laws of gravity doesn't mean that it exempts me from them, right? Now, there's not, a, there's not a part of any business represented here where people are not integral to what's done. Uh, I have uh, this uh, picture that 
somebody took of a, a factory, a modern factory. And if you, as you look at that, if you can see it clearly, uh, what do you notice is missing? The little people. I went, I went to a factory in Japan over 20 years ago that was completely, completely automated. At night, they turned the lights out and went home. And they made product all night long. That was 20 some years ago. And we made a lot of advances in that. I wish I had the time to give you a, 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 a talk on technology because some of the things that are being done today are just truly amazing. I mean, literally amazing. I learned just last week that, in fact, they now are able, if you go in, let's say you go into the uh, hospital with a wound on your, on your hand or the arm or something, they can take DNA, a swab of your mouth, they can make skin, they can make your skin and put over it as a patch. Rather than put a Band-Aid on, they just put your skin on. And it heals much quicker. Uh, you, you don't reject it. And, I mean, it's just a, I, I could talk to you all day about some of the things that are being done. They print the skin, by the way, with a 3D printer. They print it. I mean, I'm not talking about something. Uh, I'm talking about a printer that costs you $500 to buy. 3D printers can make most of its parts. In probably two years, the printer will be able to make itself. It have babies. Baby printers. Huh? You can buy a $500 <laughs> printer and go into the printing business selling printers. <coughs> now, what I've learned from going to Singularity University out in California, which is, if they want to talk about the latest in artificial intelligence and robots and you know all this sort of stuff, uh, is that uh, as much as they know about technology, They know nothing about motivation. Because the people that make these machines think that the machines are going to solve the problem. And my point is that somebody at, at least has to turn on the machine. Well, they say, oh, no, we got, we got, the machine can turn itself on. In 15 years, um, uh, Oh, what's his name? Predicts that it. it'll be robots will be indistinguishable from people. As a matter of fact, there may be something in there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but how would I know? How would I know? How would I know? But the thing about it is that as technologically advanced as we become, there's a point sometime, in the, at least sometime in the future, between now and then, that we're going to need. Uh, robot to assist us. We need that. The robot comes. It's like uh, there are movies now about robots, and there's a movie called Her, where a guy fell in love with this computer. And uh, that's already happening, by the way, with uh, robot uh, dogs. They make these robot dogs that go into dangerous places. And because they provide a benefit to the user, they, they form an emotional attachment to them. They want to keep them, and they, they, they grieve when they blow up. <coughs> That's a natural thing. Because we like situations where we have some benefit from being with somebody or something. You have favorite things around your house that are not animate, but you like them. And you, 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 when they break or when you can't use them anymore, you feel sad about it, right? And you, sometimes you just keep the old thing, even though it doesn't work, because you just hate to throw it away. Well, that's natural. But it's an example of positive reinforcement and how it affects us in terms of the way we, we behave, wherever we are. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time to teach you the science, but I want to give you a vision of what the science can do. Uh, 
it, 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 if you think about uh, psychology, I already said it doesn't have a science. It, it, psychology is the science of the mind. Now, I can tell you, I've been married 58 years, and sometimes I'm happy about that, sometimes I'm not. You know, right now, I'm pretty good with it. But as long as I've lived with her, I cannot read her mind. Now, I'm trained to read people's minds. I mean, I got a degree in mind reading. But I've got to tell you, some of the things she does, I think, what are you doing? She said, well, it's perfectly obvious. To who? <laughs> Notice what goes in her mind, what comes out, it's like, where'd you get that? I can't tell what she's going to do. I mean, I've lived for a long time, and I can't read her mind. And anytime, you know, it's popular these days to have books. If you want to sell books, put in the title something about neuroscience. Oh, boy. That'll, that'll get the buyer. Because people feel, and, and the, the, the authors will tell you that they're able, with electrodes on your head and so on, to read your mind. And they're wrong, they can't do that. It's fraud. They can't do that. They, nobody can read your mind. Now you see, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of uh, uh, body language. You see, because people who read body language are like, if, if you do like this, what they say that means. Everybody understands that it, it means you're close to my ideas, right? I mean, you're, you're kind of skeptical about what I'm saying, that sort of thing. Well, you know why I think people do this? I think a more reasonable explanation, number one, they're cold. Yeah. And number two, it's comfortable. It's more comfortable for people have a big stomach, you know, you just kind of push <laughs> off down on your stomach. But we don't have to go into this. You see, I can tell you, anytime you try to figure somebody out, you're more likely to be wrong, wrong than right. And so what we try to do is to look at behavior and, and to attend to behavior in its own right. That somebody says, I love you, we assume they mean that. But see, it's like with my wife, and I know you've had a similar kind of appearance. When I say to my wife, what's, the wrong, what's wrong? What's the matter? She says, nothing. <laughs> I know you better not say, well, I'm off to play golf, or I'll see you later. Don't do that. Now, am I not reading body language? Well, I... I I'm not reading her language, but I know that that behavior, the way she's, what she says, and what her body position is, has, I have learned that is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. <laughs> so you better be timid, you better say, well, it seems like there's something going on. <laughs> Tell me about it. And finally, she'll say, well, you know what you did. <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> so, but we learn in terms of interaction with people, we learn to certain ways we use our hands, the way we use words and so on, mean something one way or another. If you say, if you say, you're doing a good job, that means I don't know if I'm doing a good job. Because he tells everybody to do a good job. So how would I know that I'm doing a better job than somebody else? Or I'm even doing a good job? Because he may be saying that. You've heard me. Oh, you're just saying that. Now, I want to emphasize to you today uh, that we're talking about all behavior. We started in clinical situations because, in fact, it was an easy place to go. No, you know, do something radical, something experimental, then it, since nobody's doing anything, we were welcome. But when we got the results there, then they always said, well, it works there, but will it work? Now, you may not be able to tell this, but I'm from the South in the United States. And I don't think I have an accent, but other people tell me that it is. <laughs> and, uh, when we would start 
doing stuff in the South, which what you did, uh, people when we say, well, it worked over there, the other the plant over the other side of town, they would say, yeah, but those guys, we're different, right? We're different. Same time, we're different. They make so and so, we make so and so, we're different. Well, when we worked with that plant and it was got good results, then we go north and they'd say, well, here's, let me tell you what we did down south. Guess what they'd say? We're different. And when we did our first work in Italy, it was the first work we did outside the United States, they said, well, we're right. They're right. Is it different from you? I think so. I mean, we're all different. <laughs> See, now the interesting thing about science is that it has to work. If it's, a, if it's truly a science, guess what? It works on everybody. And there are no two people alike. Not even, not even a twin is like the other. Every twin knows which one was born first, right? And it's like, well, Mama always favored you because you were her first child. Right? You see, the second child coming into the world is, is treated different. I did my uh, master's uh, thesis on, uh, I mean, on my uh, uh, doctoral thesis on uh, birth order and achievement. And uh, what you find is that most firstborn go to church, go to college, much fewer than later born, even though the family is in a better position economically usually to send the last born to school than they were the first. And first born are represented in the professions more often than last born. And I could tell you a lot about that, but the point is that people read that and say, well, I'm first born, so I should be in the profession. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what it's about. What it's about is the way you are treated in the family, because there's some families, like uh, most first born are found in the professions, most last born are found in uh, sports and sales and social, where social uh, contact is, is more common. But see, there, there are a lot of Last born children are very shy and very withdrawn, right? You probably know something. It's not the birth order that causes this behavior. It's how the person is treated. And how they learn to interact with the family and that kind of thing is what causes these differences that we see. But the probability is, if you were first born, that if, do we have any last born children? Any of you who are last born? Have you ever seen a baby book of you? The <laughs> 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 middle ones are just lost. I mean, you get that. <laughs> you know, you're, you're in trouble. You see, you, you know, you see, it, it's the baby book. The baby book for the first one is about this thing, and if you have one for the last last one, it's about this thing. Yeah. I remember my wife made, a, I had two daughters, and my wife uh, made a mistake one time of talking about uh, Joanna, who was, who was a baby, like, uh, she's a 50 year old baby, but. Uh, oh, well, you were, you were, you, but you were second born. It's like, we didn't do that for you. But it's like in the baby book, the first born, it's like the first word you said, that they got in there, when, the day when you saw what you said, and when you smiled at your daddy, and you know, all these sorts of things, right? And so you've got to understand, if you understand reinforcement, that they get reinforced for a lot of things that the later ones know. And most of the time it's accomplishment, right? Some are kind of first step, yeah. First word, first smile, all that. Because it's new, it's novel to the pair, so it's reinforceable. And so when I come home, my wife said, you know what Laurie did? <laughs> you know. Well, we never heard that about Joe. Well, I mean, we've heard that already. You know, it was, it was old news. <laughs> it's not new news. We know it's a different, different, different person. And so it forms our personality, or we call it personality, in large part, but it goes unnoticed because it's just, we're just living. We're not, we're not doing an experiment with our children. <coughs> we're just living. But the point
point is that we all change every day. Nobody stays the same unless they're what? Dead. If you're dead, you don't change. But otherwise, you're changing. Now, you see, in a company, we change behavior every day. We don't know it, but we do. Every interaction changes people. Now, the point is that it takes more than one reinforcement to, change, to develop a habit. So, because you have an interaction with somebody, it changes both of you, your behaviors. But then you'll have another one with another person who actually reinforces the opposite. So the net result at the end of the day is you change, but it's not a noticeable kind of thing. My wife often says that I'm stubborn. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's probably some evidence for that. But the point is that she thinks I'm getting more and more stubborn as I get older. Now, I don't know whether she's doing this to me or not, deliberately. Now, is she trying to make me more stubborn? I don't know, because she's not systematically uh, inadvertently reinforcing stubborn behavior. And so that's why, you know, it appears that you're pretty much the same day to day, even though I'm saying you're changing every day. Some things you, you do more often, you like more often, some things you don't. See, it's like as you get older, some things, because you're uh, being physically uh, challenged, as they would say, uh, you, you, used to, you used to enjoy something, now you don't enjoy it as much. And so you develop other likes, other things that you like more. Not that you don't like that, but it's just that it provides you with more reinforcement than the other thing. Now, most people, and I would, I would suggest that it's not uh, particularly effective or, or, or pleasurable to try to analyze every, everything. Because people think, when, when they find out what I do, it's like all of a sudden they get scared, like, like you, 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 you're watching me, you're, you're doing stuff to me. Well, I'm not, you know, I, I, because I, I've talked about people, you know, about uh, when people start talking about behavior and they know what I do, they kind of get, say, well, now, I, I don't study this. I'm not looking at you. I'm not, you're not, a, you're not a, a, a subject or an experiment for me. You're just another person. So I, I act as just like being fluent in a foreign language. You know, you don't have to think. If you're speaking in English and that's not your native language, you don't have to think about if you're fluent, you don't think about, oh, I need to speak English. You just do it, right? That's sort of the same way with behavior. You just, you know, you just behave in a natural way, even though you understand that if I'm having a, a, an interaction with somebody, I, you know, behavior's changing. Well, I'm not thinking, what, what, what is, what's changing about my behavior? You just do it. Now, my point with this is, and it's probably a long way to, to say it, is that, most of the time, we don't understand how we are shaping behavior. Everybody, I think, here would agree that we learn from our environment. But would everybody okay doing like this? I'm going to kind of shape you into responding. But if you, you think that's true, you need to do this. Do it. So if you look at a, a, a young a child, a baby, they're about they're doing everything. They're pulling stuff off, and, but they're learning, right? They're learning, do that more or don't do that. And so they touch something that's hot. How many times do they have to do that before they learn not to do that? Just one time, right? And then they hot, hot. And so something that's fuzzy and pleasurable, they want to play with it a lot. Something that's cold and hard, they don't want to fool it. So we learn from our environment. Now think about this for a minute in terms of your workplace. You see, we, we, we take people and, and we have a, a charity that we started last year, and our initial foray is in education. And it drives me crazy because the education system in the United States is terrible. Just terrible. And it's amazing people learn anything, you know, to be honest with you. Because if you think about a child who is five years old, 
It's hard to keep them down, right? I mean, they're into everything. And the, the most common thing they hear from their parents is, stop that, get away from that, leave that alone. I'm tired of telling you, you know, that kind of, the kind of verbiage that we use, right? Because they're just constantly exploring the environment. Then they go to school. We say, all right, sit in that desk in rows. Keep your hands and feet to yourself. If you have a question, raise your hand. What in the world happened? <laughs> all of a sudden, I was having fun. And now, all they're doing is telling me, be still. Stop that. Listen to me. I don't like this. They might like the idea, you know, like the first couple of weeks, they love it, and then after a while, you know, I have to go to school. Yes, you have to go. Now, what I want you to understand as I go through some of this quickly is that if you believe that the environment changes behavior, which it does, in other words, it provides reinforces, punishes, and the like, then if people don't behave right at work, whose problem is it? You, you design the environment, right? So if you design the environment by the policies and rules and all this sort of stuff, the physical location the, and all that, if you design that and people don't act right in it, what does that tell you? Where's the fault? It's in environment. I was talking to a group yesterday. I mean, blame is not a concept we use very often in this baby change business. We don't blame the person for acting naturally in environmental behavior. You see, if, if, you, if you lock the person in this room, the natural behavior would be to try to get out, right? So if we see people breaking the window, you know, it's a natural thing we expect. Because I've tried the doors, and the doors won't open, and you know, I, I don't know any other way to do that, so I break the window. I mean, that's a natural thing to do. It's not unusual to you, even in Holland, I think you'll find this, this situation that, that people at first, they're excited about a new job. They get a new job, and how long are they excited? short time, right? Because what happens is that their expectations in terms of what they thought would happen to them having this job, what they were able to do, they were going to have, I'll have more responsibility, I'll be able to make more things happen, you know, in that job that I do now, and all of a sudden they realize they can't. So they're going to find reinforcement. That's our nature. So if we can't find it in the job, where do we find it? Well, if you have a cell phone, that's one way, right? Or if you can go on the internet, or this kind of thing. You know. Well, so what a lot, of, a lot of businesses try to do is say they find people on the internet all the time, so what do they do? You know, it's interesting, in the United States, the most, most uh, searched topic during work hours is sex. During work hours. The people are uh, uh, searching for sex uh, sites, you know, and that sort of thing. Because there's no reinforcement in their work. Well, how can we compete with that? Well, it's hard. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, if that's the only way you can get reinforcement, that's the way you get it. See, if I'm not getting reinforcement from my work, then I turn first to my core, right? And we'll talk about a movie we saw last night or television, something on television or, or that kind of thing. But we're going to get it. So the point is, you need to design the environment in a way that's favorable to the work you want. And to blame people gets you nowhere. And I find this all the time, I say, when we go, I say, well, how, people tell me, well, we've got a problem. Well, how long have you had that problem? Ever since I've been here. Well, how long have you been here? 26 years. 26 years you've had the same problem? 
Well, you see, the reason they have the same problem is they blame the person. What's wrong with you? As much as I, I like to do that too, it's not helpful. But I want to change, I want to change him, not the environment. <coughs> now you see, if you think about rules, if you have a rule, by the way, if you have a rule, somebody is going to be upset. I can predict that. Even the person that made the rule is going to be upset to see what I'm following. And the people who follow the rule don't like it because they have to follow the rule. But the way we try to manage behavior at work is to make rules. I was uh, boarding a plane a while back in Atlanta and it had just rained. And it was at a gate where you had to walk on the tarmac to get to the plane. And they had two lines, two yellow lines drawn, about three feet apart, going to the ramp, to the plane, instead. This gate agent had a fit because people were walking outside the line to avoid the puddle in the road. You know, right? She was having a fit. Now, she was following the rule. I mean, it was a rule. That you keep people in the guidelines because of the safety issue, you don't might run into a propeller or something, so you do that. And so I was one of the ones she was yelling at because I didn't want to get my shoes wet. And I stepped out, maybe a foot outside the line, and she had a fit. Well, there's some organizations where safety people would say, boy, she's right. I'm glad you told me about that because she is right. Who, who, who is she? But she followed the rule. But we don't understand. We made the rule to change behavior. We expect you to dress a certain way. We expect you to act a certain way when you come. We expect that. But we haven't designed the environment to produce that kind of behavior. And so the way we look at that is to say, OK, is there a way we can design it so that it will work, so that they're happy about it, we're happy too. And what we try to do, lots of places, is to eliminate the rules. Or let the employees figure out the rules. Working the 3M plant over in uh, Decatur, Alabama, and uh, they were going from two shifts to three shifts. They're going to work 24 hours a day. And so they designed a shift arrangement where you work uh, three 10 hour days and I don't know what all. Some work four hour days. And people got real upset about that. And uh, so they were making all, excuse me, all kind of noise about it. And uh, the manager who we've done some work with says, okay, well, excuse me, this is, this is what we thought. Why don't y'all decide? You know, this is the old way. This is the new way. Y'all figure it out. So they got a committee together. They worked on it for about a month. And they came back in Florida to the manager and they said, well, we've looked at everything, all the different configurations, and we think the one you've come up with is the best. Mm -hmm. No, no, no browsing there. Everybody, I mean, look, we decided that this is the best way to do it, so why don't we do it this way? I'm not following my script, but you're reinforcing the wrong stuff. I don't know how this is happening, but it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> but the, what, what's happening in the world today, and I, I don't have time to tell you all, and I don't know 